even heard some criticism. I haven't, I haven't researched it very, enough, very well, so I think it's a little bit irresponsible for me to bring it up. But there are um, criticisms that the universal laws have changed. There's measurements in gravity changing. There's uh, measurements in the speed of light that are, that are varying. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm not sure how well these are vetted. Those have actually been vetted to shit, and they are worthless. Uh, a whole bunch of scientists went through all of those claims, made mostly by Kent Hovind, um, you know, Ken Ham, Lee Strobel, those kinds of guys. And they have no credibility at all. If you change the speed of light, everything in physics has to change. Many equations are based on that number. Gravity wouldn't be the same. Nothing would be the same if the speed of light changed. But it, it stands to reason to me there are enough things that we don't understand. I mean, the simple fact that I could look at someone and then when they're facing away from me and they will turn and face me, right? The Schrodinger cats type of thing. Um, uh, what's the quantum physics? That, this, is, this is what it gets into. You can't have an experiment uh, that's not affected by the person observing it. These things, <clears throat> there are things here that we do not understand yet. There's a bunch of them that we do not understand yet. And I'm all about science. I'm all about figuring these things out. But just because we don't understand them... And Doesn't mean we should make wild assertions about them? Is that what you're going to say? Like, for example, God did it? Let me phrase that differently. Just because we understand some of them and we think we could figure out the rest of them, there's nothing about that that disproves God. And I know they call this the God of the gaps fallacy, but that, that doesn't, that still doesn't mean it's, it's not a fallacy. It, it, it could all be a mechanism of what God created. That's right. It doesn't mean that God couldn't have done it. It doesn't mean that pink unicorns couldn't have done it with their magic either. And I just want to point out that there are many things that we know for a fact about reality. Evolution is a fact about reality. Outside of those things, you can believe about whatever you want, but in the end, you have to know that there is no proof for your position. There is no evidence for it. It's completely based on faith. And here's the bottom line with faith. If you have faith, you don't have evidence. And if you have evidence, you don't need faith. They're mutually exclusive. And I, I come across this my, as um, this is a point of um, a difficulty I have with my, my own beliefs, because I think if, if I were to ask an atheist, what or uh, let's say a skeptic. Whoa, what's wrong with atheists? If I were to ask a skeptic, um, what would change your mind on uh, belief in God? What would cause you to believe in God? Well, a reasonable skeptic would say evidence. You know, I use the term atheist because it's explosive. It wakes people up. It gets their attention. Of course, if evidence came in that God was real, I would examine it. If it was valid, I would believe in God. But I've put a lot of thought into this, because evidence of intelligent design is not evidence of the Judeo-Christian God. That's just evidence of intelligent design. It could have been aliens for all we know. So what would convince me of the Christian position? One of the things that would convince me is if I looked up in the sky and the stars rearranged before my eyes to spell out the words, I wrote the Bible. And it was verified by people across the world. It was even caught on camera. I think even then I'd have reservations, but that's what it would take to convince me. Something of that magnitude. And then you ask a Christian the same thing. What would make you believe in God? And you would say, um, or would you not believe in God? And the Christian would say, nothing. Blind faith. Fucking stupid. I hate that. Okay? If you give me evidence that God isn't real, then I will believe that God isn't real. But what is the burden for that evidence? And that's the, that's the difficult part for me. So for me, the burden of that would be, you would have to show me something that created Earth or created the universe or the Big Bang that did it completely independent of God. Like it was some great aliens, a bunch of great aliens come together and say, hey, look, we seeded the planet like this and we did all this and we're not gods. 
I can get that. I can get behind that. But <clears throat> it would have to be something really high on that extremist. And I know that's not fair. I know that's not fair for a logical skeptic who's arguing against me to, to say that. It's a difficult argument. And I'm, I'm trying to square it in my own mind to where I could still be a reasonable skeptic and and still you know have these these um this this faith that i have i'm sure you know this already but logic dictates that the default position is disbelief in every circumstance so i can tell you i have a pink elephant in my cupboard do you need to prove to me that i don't no you just need to disbelieve it i have to prove it to you so as a positive claim Christians have to prove that God is real. Atheists don't have to prove that he isn't. And that's why I, I, I relegate my, my beliefs as beliefs and not knowledge. Because I don't have the certainty that God exists. He hasn't come down and chatted with me. But I have a bunch of little things, you know, like I said, the quantum physics stuff, um, the, the sense of a spirit or a soul or these weird feelings that we all have. And I know these are very anecdotal and a lot of people deny them, but a lot of people support them too. So we can't throw them out. They're representative of, uh, you know, average people. We can throw them out if we have a valid understanding of what is happening inside the brain. There's a study called The God Helmet. I talked about it in one of my earlier videos, but basically some scientists put a helmet on these people and it had electrodes coming in from each side of the helmet and it was stimulating a specific part of the brain. So they put this helmet on these people and they put a blindfold on them, they put them in a dark room and they shut the door. They were completely cut off from all of their senses. And when they stimulated the helmet, the people could point out entities in the room with them. One, two, three, four, five. They could even point to where the entities were standing. We know that this awe-inspiring feeling of religious zeal and a presence around us is inspired by something inside of our brains, not something outside of our brains. Or, at the very least, we have an explanation of where it comes from, from within our brains. I actually started watching a whole bunch of videos on, on the Big Bang Theory, uh, TED Talks, all kinds of you know, advanced stuff. And I, I know you say the models are accurate. Uh, they're accurate based on what we can measure. But, and I think that's missing the point of what we can't measure. As I alluded to with the other stuff, the quantum mechanics. Um, it, it, there's still a bunch of stuff we can't measure. So I, I like the Big Bang Theory. I like that we, you know, it makes sense. But once again, the Big Bang Theory is completely in line with the Bible. You know, uh, let there be light, flash, boom, uh, form the planets, uh, form animals. That's completely in line with what the what Genesis reads. So to me, that's just supporting the idea of the Big Bang and Christianity being, or at least the Bible being the correct uh, interpretation there. Oh, sure, I have no problem with Christians accepting the Big Bang Theory and staying Christian. Although I will contest your comment there about how it's perfectly in line with the Bible. I don't think that's quite the case, because Genesis says that plants came before the sun came, for example. And young Earth creationists are hard line about this. So I think if you read the Bible in broad strokes, as you do, I think that you're in good shape. But when you start reading it literally, that is when it becomes a problem. That's when you start denying scientific facts like the Big Bang or evolution or things like that. Um, there was another comment um, uh, towards the end there about me um, or about the earth being created in six days uh, using the word yom. Um, I, I, I am completely not a literalist in the Bible. I think um, anybody who is, I mean, well, it disproves itself. Uh, the Bible is written by man, the, my, the, the by man, right? Man writes the Bible. The Bible defines man as being flawed. The Bible has to be flawed. That's by, by its own definition, it's flawed. Um, further, you look into um, uh, the translations. We have different languages, translation errors. Yeah. And then some books, the, the literary style that we read it in is we try to interpret it like modern uh, Western literary interpretations. Um, the Bible was even written for that, like the book of Jonah is completely satire. Um, 
so th- there's so much in there that's not accurate the you know it's not supposed to be so that's why i never dig down in it and quote and say like oh this look at this verse says you can't eat shellfish so we don't eat shell, shellfish no i don't i don't do that I, I i think that's it's wasteful you have to read it in broad strokes when you read the bible and when you read the bible in broad strokes you get reoccurring themes and messages and things and i believe those are the spirit of the bible that's the soul of christianity i think that's a fantastic way to look at it but I don't think that many Christians share your view on it. And I'm kind of confused as to why you're denying science, like scientific fact, like evolution and the Big Bang and and things like that, and why you're embracing Noah's Flood. That is very clearly allegory at best, complete bullshit at worst. Embrace science and Christianity at the same time. You don't have to be one or the other. It's not necessarily a dichotomy, especially when you look at the Bible the way you personally do. And it's about second chances. It's about forgiveness. It's about love. I think it's fantastic that you got that out of it, but I don't think that 90% of the Christians that read it got the same thing out of it. A lot of atheists look at the, the flood, flooding the world, and, um, and say, well, this is just evil. He just murdered the entire world. Well, you're stupid if you say that, because if you're reading the Bible and you're reading it as, in terms of proper context, uh, we're talking about humanity. <gasps> no, I don't say that. I say it's for pretensies. So he flooded it because he realized the wickedness in men was too great and it was, it was getting out of control. So he decided to flood it and kill all the bad people and save the one family that's good. And then they will repopulate the earth. That is a second chance for humanity. It's not a second chance for all those little individuals that died. But the fact that we're all here today and that we are uh, reasonably moral people, right? Even if you're not a Christian, there's a, t- I mean, the majority of the world is moral. That is because the wickedness in men was stamped out with that flood. So it was a big second chance. And the biggest second chance, of course, is Jesus dying on the cross for all of our sins. I thought you said you were a skeptic. These honestly don't sound like allegories to you, just like campfire stories that were told to children down generations. These really sound like literal, true, actual stories to you that is a, a another second chance. So I don't read the Bible in terms of little things. I read it in terms of the big messages, and that's how I interpret it, and that's how I, I, how I structure my faith. You just gave me two examples of where you read it in little messages, the Jesus story and the flood story. Why do you read those little messages and read everything else in the big picture? Why don't you just read those as big picture stories also, not literal, just stories from which you can derive morals. Um, and then, um, so in closing, the last part of the video criticizing mine was uh, saying that I don't know is a perfectly valid answer. And to that, I will reply, you're right, it is a valid answer. I don't know. I don't know how the universe was created. I don't know if God is real. I don't know these things with certainty, but I believe them. I have no problem with that. You can go on believing your stuff and I will not try to stop you. The only thing I request is that you really research evolution as you say you did the Big Bang Theory, because these things are facts. Evolution is more solid than the Big Bang, more solid than about any other theory because it's been vetted by Christians more than anything else. And I believe them reasonably. That's where you lost me. Because I have enough circumstantial evidence. I have enough flawed evidence that is better than no evidence. I will agree that circumstantial evidence is better than no evidence. And the flawed evidence that that I have doesn't contradict the good evidence that I do have. And the good evidence that I do have doesn't answer all the questions or contradict the circumstantial evidence that I do have. And that, my friend, that is where we part ways. Your evidence for God does contradict evidence for reality. Evolution is a fact. The Big Bang is a fact. We know these things to be true. And 
you are asserting, as many other Christians are, maybe the royal you, is asserting that evolution is not a fact, that it's not established science. That is a problem for me, because it is established science. Christians' claims directly contradict established science. So, for me, it makes sense. You know, I'm, I'm not about shoving my faith in anybody's face or making them feel bad about it. I, I'm, what I am about it is, is no zealotry. And I think the atheism is running off with that stuff. And they, they, people get spiteful. They've had bad experience with some, you know, Catholicism or whatever, Islam. They've had some experience with it, and they just want to fight it and fight it and fight it. Yeah, that happens. I'll attest to that. I used to be Jehovah's Witness. I got disfellowshipped for smoking cigarettes when I was 18 years old. My parents kicked me out of my house. I rarely talk to them now, very rarely. And I am bitter over that. But I still believed it after I got disfellowshipped. I believed it for about two or three years afterward. Until I really started researching it. Really started looking into facts. Learning about it. I didn't even believe in evolution at first. I just followed the evidence and discovered that there was none for God. That's when I started looking into evolution, the Big Bang, and all that other stuff, and realized that they are scientific facts. But you know what? We're in line, you know? At least I am with you, and I, I, that's kind of why I make these videos, because I want to spread the reasonable practice of faith, right? the reasonable belief in God. I want to spread that. I don't want to spread cults. I don't want to spread blind faith. I hate that stuff. I appreciate that. Really, I do. A lot of the time, I am mistaken for an atheist zealot, just like you're talking about. But I'm sure, as everybody on my channel and as you can see, I'm really not. I am in your face about it. I alert everybody around me that I am atheist, but I'm not an asshole. I talk about it a little bit, and I make it known that that's what I am. So that when they see that I'm really a nice guy, they know that atheists don't all eat babies. I mean, I haven't eaten a baby in who knows how long, months. Like I said, I want to be the, the person of faith for the atheist. <laughs> Man, that makes me sound terrible. I'm a bad Christian. I might go to hell for that one. <laughs> Good news, buddy. You're not going to hell because hell was made up by the Catholic Church. Street.